There are kings and queens of England we've all heard of many times. Henry VIII, Elizabeth I, probably Richard III. But what about Henry VI, who had a special connection to this area in the mid-1460s, a time of turbulence as ever and plague? After fighting and losing the Hundred Years' War with France, England then experienced what became known as the Wars of the Roses, a fight for the right to rule England between the houses of York and Lancaster. The Wars of the Roses occupied much of the last half of the 15th century. The protagonists were the families and supporters of the Dukes of Lancaster and York. The leaders of the factions at the time of interest to this story were King Henry VI of the House of Lancaster and King Edward IV of the House of York. Yes, in principle, two kings at the same time. Henry VI had become king in 1421, when he was less than a year old. Although Henry's father, Henry V, was the hero of the Battle of Agincourt, our Henry was not a warrior, being pious and scholarly, and, although loved for his gentleness, was ineffective as a medieval monarch. As a fellow descendant of Edward III, Edward Earl of March, after battlefield successes, was offered the crown and became King Edward IV in 1461. Clitheroe itself did not experience any battles during the Wars of the Roses, the nearest and possibly bloodiest of all being over 50 miles away at Towton, near Tadcaster, in 1461. Here, the Yorkists were led by the newly crowned King Edward, the 19-year-old son of the late Duke of York, recently killed at the Battle of Wakefield. Despite the resounding defeat of the Lancastrians at Towton, rumblings of Lancastrian support continued in the north of England. Finally, in 1464, the two sides came to blows at the Battle of Hexham, at which the Lancastrians were again soundly beaten. The Yorkists showed no mercy and beheaded the whole of the Lancastrian military hierarchy here in Hexham Marketplace. King Henry VI was not actually at the Battle of Hexham but was a short distance away at Bywell Castle. The Yorkists, hoping to capture the king, galloped to Bywell only to find that he had fled, leaving behind his coronated helmet. This was subsequently presented to Edward IV. For the next year, Henry lurked around the sparsely populated and moorland countryside of the north of England, moving from one safe house to another. Meanwhile, his wife, the unpopular Margaret of Anjou, was beavering away in Scotland and France, hoping to regroup support for the Lancastrian cause with the aim of restoring Henry and their son to the monarchy. During his wanderings, Henry spent some time at Muncaster Castle in Cumberland. As a memento of his stay, he gifted the Pennington family a glass drinking bowl, which can be seen there to this day. Legend has it that Henry promised the family a prosperous future so long as the bowl remains intact. The Pennington still own the thriving Muncaster Castle and the bowl is known as the Luck of Muncaster. Henry was obliged to keep moving to avoid capture and his wanderings led him on to spend time with the Pudsey family at Bolton Hall in Bolton by Boland in the Ribble Valley. We have memorials of his stay there too in that he is said to have divined a well. The well is still there and is known as King Henry's Well, now a listed monument. It is on private land but can be seen from a public footpath through the estate. It is said that the design of the tower of the village's 15th century church was influenced by Henry VI. His next refuge was even closer to Clitheroe, as he moved to be hosted by Richard Tempest in Waddington Hall. We can only surmise at Henry's motives for doing this, as it turned out to be a disastrous move for him. Although Richard Tempest had fought for the Lancastrian side at Wakefield and Towton, after Towton 
the family changed allegiance to become supporters of Edward IV. When Henry arrived at Waddington Hall, he presumably thought it was to be with friends. We can only assume that Richard Templest was a polite host, but in a difficult position with an anointed king on his doorstep, whom he had previously supported. The end game for Henry was actively initiated by another visitor to Waddington Hall, one William Cantor, the Black Monk of Abingdon, who was resting at the hall on his journey between the abbeys of Sawley and Worley. The Black Monk recognised Henry and warned Richard's brother, John Tempest, of Bashall Eaves. Thus, after about a year on the run, we come to one evening in 1465, as Henry sat down to dinner with his host Sir Richard Tempest, loyal servants burst into the hall to say that the enemy was at the gates. John Tempest and fellow Yorkist William Harrington burst into the dining room. Henry's faithful retainer Robert Tunsell drew his sword while Richard Tempest just sat back and watched. After a brief skirmish in which John Tempest's arm was broken, Henry escaped down a secret staircase and out into the open. He fled south for about a mile towards the Ribble. It was to be the last free mile of his life, across fields and down through the woods to Brungerley Hippingstones. It was here that Henry, dishevelled, exhausted and dispirited, was finally run down. He was loaded onto a horse and taken to Clitheroe Castle where he was held for the night. The next day he began his final journey across his country to end his days in the Tower of London. He met his end on the 21st of May 1471, aged 50, having been king for 49 of these years. On a wall of Clitheroe Castle there used to be a plaque commemorating the king's stay, but its whereabouts are presently unknown. And to end our story, it is of interest to note that the Hipping Stones are still there, near where the present Brungerley Bridge stands. They are revealed occasionally when the river is very low. But of this sad little episode in the Wars of the Roses, there is nothing here to remind us. No board, no blue sign, no memorial. So when you are here, please do spare a thought for Henry and his last desperate flight for freedom.